1 Corinthians 15. This chapter is so loaded with a lot of preaching, but let's look in verse number 51. The Bible says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruption shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. Lord, thank you for the good singing. Lord, I'm glad you're our shepherd. Lord, I'm glad we're headed to Beulah land. It seems like the singing's kind of went along with the thought, uh, part of the message tonight. We're certainly glad when you orchestrate and do things like that. Now, Lord, we thank you for this good number out on this Wednesday night. Lord, we realize that many of your people have worked hard this week. They've had to face the uh, world and the devil and the flesh. And Lord, uh, they've come there this way on this Wednesday night seeking help, seeking you. God, I pray you'd manifest yourself through the preaching of the Word of God in a wonderful way. I pray that uh, hearts would be lifted. I pray that your people would be edified and encouraged in the faith. I pray we'd leave uh, in victory. We'd leave excited about the goodness of God. Uh, Father, I do pray, Lord, for those that are in the fight and those that are battling things and those that are facing obstacles and hardships that, God, you'd bring some serenity to that. You'd help them to understand a little bit more why they're going through what they're going through. Now, Father, I do pray in a crowd this size, if there's someone here tonight unsaved, lost without God, I pray that tonight would be the night that the sweet Holy Ghost of God would roll back uh, the blinders from their eyes and help them to see their need of salvation. And I pray that tonight would be the night of their salvation. Now, Father, I do pray for... Uh, Brother Cody's efforts, and Lord, I know he's under attack, and all men of God are really under attack. And Lord, I pray that, Lord, you'd use Brother Mitch down there to silence uh, some of the mouths of those that, Lord, are being a detriment to the cause of Christ. Of course, Lord, we know through the Scriptures, every time your church is attacked, it grows. But, Lord, sometimes we get weary in the battle of having to face those kind of things, so I pray you'd give great increase, and you'd do great things in that. I'm reminded what uh, uh, Paul wrote there the, about the, the Christians who were slow battles whose mouths must be stopped. And God, I pray you just show yourself mighty and mighty to save. Now, Father, be with those that are sick, be with those that are providentially hindered, those that are watching via live stream, be with them. Lord, help Brother Ray in his upcoming surgery. Thank you for the good testimonies and the good sweet spirit in the house of God. Help us now, for it's in the wonderful name of Jesus we ask these things. Amen and amen. I want to draw your attention to several things from the text before we get to the message. I want you to notice that the Apostle Paul, being inspired by the Holy Ghost, is pinning down some thoughts, first of all, concerning the mystery. We find in verse number 51, he says, Behold, I show you a mystery. What is the mystery? Folks like a good mystery. What is the mystery? The mystery is not everybody's going to die. Uh, that's a mystery. And from the moment we're born, we know there's coming a day out there somewhere we're going to die. But not everybody. I dare say mm, there's going to be some in this uh, sanctuary tonight that will not face death in the traditional sense. Uh, what a blessing to know that the Bible's unfolding right before our eyes. You look around at what's going on in this world, I don't know about you, but this world has gone insane. I can't keep up with the insanity. I mean, everything going on, uh, 
uh, uh, they're putting titles. I, I mean, I, I grew up, uh, uh, we had to learn pronouns. We learned he was for boys and she's were for girls. And now it's it's and thems. I mean, I can't keep up with it all. Well, uh, I, I've seen some it's. I didn't know what they were. Uh, they weren't where, where I was from, I guarantee you that. Uh, 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 and then we've got all kinds of things now. Critical race theory. Here's the critical race. It's the human race. Uh, and they're critical. Uh, they're lost in sin on their way to hell. Uh, uh, Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, shed his precious blood uh, uh, to redeem sinful man. Uh, he's no respecter of persons. Uh, hey, as a little kid, we used to sing uh, yellow, red, and black, and white. They're all precious in his sight. Uh, he tasted death for every man. The critical race there is we need to get them to Jesus. Uh, we got all kinds of things going on in this world. We've got uh, 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 people running this country who aren't running this country. Uh, 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 we've got folks uh, standing in high offices that don't even know what the Constitution they've sworn to uphold says. Uh, 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 we're living in a mess uh, uh, where they say if you leave the country, you need a passport to get back in, uh, but illegals can come and don't need any documentation. I mean, it's gone insane. Mm, I ain't even going to get into pride and... I always thought pride was a lion group, but that's a whole nother thing. I mean, we got all kinds of things going on in this country. It doesn't even resemble the America that most of us grew up with. You say, what is happening? Everything is being set in order for the ushering in of the Antichrist. I'm here to tell you, this thing's about over. We ought to take refuge in that. There's a mystery. Not everybody's going to die. Hmm? Can I say this? Paul also deals with a manifestation. Look at verse 52. He says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Now, somebody real smart looked that up, and it's about a million times faster than the speed of light. I mean, it's quick. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Uh, for this corruptible uh, must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Uh, so when this corruption shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. There is going to be a manifestation. You see, the Lord told Moses, Flesh can't see him and live. So we've got to put off this corruptible flesh. We've got to put off uh, 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 this mortality. We've got to be changed. Uh, and I'm thankful to know that the Bible says that he's fashioned a body for us uh, like the darling Son of God. Uh, and at the trumpet uh, of the dead in Christ shall raise, uh, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, uh, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Uh, but somewhere between here and there, uh, uh, this old corruptible nature is going to be done away with, uh, and we're we're going to be given that glorified body and we'll see him as he is. Uh, what a manifestation, huh? Even Hollywood can't even come up with something that good, I'm telling you. Oh, it's old, sorry, no Gentile dogs wasn't fit for anything, uh, uh, but got saved by the grace of God. We're going to put off these old bodies uh, and be given one just like Jesus himself. There's the manifestation. There's the mystery. Now notice the marvelous. Verse 55 says, O death, where's thy sting? O grave, where's thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The psalmist said that death is the king of terrors. People are afraid to die because we don't know what death is really like because we've never died. Now, spiritually, we died out to sin, but we've never physically died. And uh, there are some fears there. There's a great fear there if you don't know the Lord. And you don't know what's on the other side. But even folks that are saved don't get up and say, Boy, I hope today's the day I die. But rest assured, when it is your time, God has grace and dying grace for when it's time for you to cross over. But can I help you something? The sting of death has been removed for Christians, for believers. Whatever pain and misery there is in death is removed 
That's marvelous. Hmm? I got also, I got some good news. Death doesn't keep you. The strength of the grave has been removed because Jesus conquered death, hell, and the grave. My dear friends, you and I are more than conquerors in Him. The grave couldn't keep Him. It won't keep you and I. What a blessing. Uh, that's marvelous. Uh, and I'm glad that we have victory in Jesus Christ. What a blessing. It's marvelous. Hmm? Now let me say this. Notice, if you will, the motivation. Because there's a mystery, I may not die. Because of the manifestation, I'm going to be changed. And because of the marvelous that death can't hold me and the sting's been removed, that ought to motivate me. Hmm? Can I say this? I didn't have to come to church. I got to come to church. Monday night, we went out passing out tracts. I didn't have to do that. I got to do that. Are you listening? What is our motivation? Well, that's verse 58. Therefore, because of those things, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. My motivation ought to be to be what He is, faithful. I ought to strive to be steadfast. But I want to focus on verse 57 for our thought tonight. He says, But thanks be to God which giveth us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm interested in that victory tonight. 1 John chapter 5, verse number 4 says this, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Romans chapter 8, that great chapter in the book of Romans, says this in verse 31, What shall we say to these things if God be for us? Who can be against us? Verse 37 says, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. Can I say as believers, as born again, saved uh, children of God, uh, we have victory. We have victory over damnation. I don't have to worry about dying and going to hell. Got saved 47 years ago. Been washed in the blood. Uh, my name's been written down in glory. Uh, hey, uh, uh, what a blessing. I've been sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. Uh, uh, I don't have to worry about dying and going to hell. I've had people tell me to go there, and I just tell them I'm not going because of the blood of Christ. Uh, I have victory over damnation. As we've just read, I have victory over death. Death will not hold me. And we also have victory for our daily lives. Now, some days it doesn't seem like we have much victory. But victory sure is available. And this is what I want to preach on with God's help for just a little bit tonight. I mean, we have victory. We're overcomers. Well, you hear songs about being overcomers and more than conquerors and having the victory and victory in Jesus and we're on the winning side and all those things. Well, this is what I want to preach on. Why does winning feel so much like losing? Let me say it again. Why does winning feel so much like losing? I mean, we're winners. I've read the back of the book. We win. John's already seen me in heaven. I can't understand that. blows my mind to think about it, but he's already seen the bride of Christ over there. Blows my mind. He's seen me over there. He's seen Brother Phil waving. Glory! But it seems like living in the nasty now and now, there's not much sweet victory. Hmm. Uh, I've never heard somebody run in and shout and say, Hallelujah, the doctor said it was cancer. That don't seem like victory. Huh? I've seen a lot of folks here lately come in, their whole world's been shattered. Doesn't seem like a lot of victory. You know, we, we, we talk a big game, and, and a lot of people writing books about being victorious, but in reality, it doesn't translate to people's lives. Why does winning feel so much like losing? The great Apostle Paul, who was used to pin down the words we read tonight, uh, he was stoned, 
He was beaten three times, 39 stri or 40 stripes saved one. He was in prison, wrote this epistle while he was in prison. He was abased. He was impoverished. And yet, he still speaks of being victorious. I want to tell you, if the average independent fundamental Bible-believing Baptist went through one-tenth of what the Apostle Paul went through, there wouldn't have been a second-generation church. Somebody gets get their panties in the wad because somebody didn't shake their hand, they don't come back to church for six months. Hmm? Did you ever consider maybe they're having a bad day and they didn't even see you? Hmm? I do read where we're to esteem others better than ourselves. Can I say this? Hebrews chapter 11 is an interesting chapter. Verse 36, the Bible says this, And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and in the caves of the earth. That doesn't sound like a bunch of winners. It sounds like a bunch of losers. They're portrayed that throughout history. Yet the Bible goes on to say that they obtained a good report. Ultimately, they were overcomers. They had the victory. Hmm? So why does winning seem like losing? Well, let me give you a few things tonight. Could I say winning seems like losing because of perspective? You're looking at things wrong. You're looking through natural eyes instead of spiritual eyes. Your perspective is all out of sort. You see, when we're hurting, when we're heartbroken, when we're harassed, we become overloaded, we become overstretched, and we become overwhelmed. I dare say, many times folks come to the house of God on Wednesday, on Sunday morning, on Sunday night, uh, and they're overloaded and overwhelmed with what's went on in their week. Brother Bob, many times they can't come to worship. They're just, getting, they're just It's a taking every fiber of their being just to get here. They're coming to get help. Instead of throwing holy hands toward heaven saying, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Can I say, we resign to feel that God is burying us in pain and problems and places too hard for us. And that makes us feel like we're losers. You know, we've, we've heard the Joe Osteen crowd. Every day's a Friday. Something good's going to happen to you today. We've heard the charismatic crowd. If you uh, 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 sow this seed, God's going to reward you a thousand times the matter. Uh, uh, we've heard all this stuff. Uh, and uh, uh, it's even filtered in our fundamentalist ranks uh, that if you don't have the right Baptist handshake, uh, you don't have a smile on your face, uh, if you don't walk around acting like uh, you have no problems, then you're a sorry Christian. I dare say they don't understand the Apostle Paul who had apostolic gifts to heal other people, had a thorn in the flesh and couldn't even heal himself. Just because you go through things does not mean God is against you. Does not mean you're a second class Christian. Doesn't mean that you're a lower class Christian. No, it just means you're facing life. Job said man's days are few and full of trouble. But listen, God is not burying you. Listen, God is planting you. Let me say it again. When all these things overwhelm you and you feel like God is burying you underneath all this stuff, He's not burying you. He's planting you. I preached a message years ago on being in God's garden and not belonging there. There are some places He plants folks and there are some that are in there that He didn't plant. But when God is planting you, it is because He wants you to sprout, not to pout. Most of God's youngins are sucking their thumb because of their life, because they don't think it should uh, be as bad as it is. We come in, 
We look over, and there's Brother Tommy. Uh, God's really blessing him real good, and we're looking at him, and we want to be planted where he's planted. Because God's against me, but he's for Tommy. Well, you don't know what's around the corner. His day might be coming. Hmm. He's not trying to bury you. He's trying to plant you. He wants you to sprout. He is, my dear friend, trying to use you to bring glory to Him. Listen, listen. After salvation, our entire experience is for the glory of God. Wherever He plants us, it is designed to show sinners the grace of God and the hope of glory in us that we might bring sons unto glory. That's why we're here. We're here to bring glory to God, and we bring glory to God by being a witness, by being light and salt to this world, by showing this world, uh, regardless of the waves, regardless of the storms, regardless of the problems, uh, regardless of the pressures, uh, uh, the grace of God and the work of God in us propels us above it. Uh, we're to bloom where we're planted, not to pout not to look at ourselves as losers and walk on our lower level. Why would the world want what we've got when we act like the world when things come our way? Hmm? Listen, we love the statement Paul went on to make, by the grace of God I am what I am. We love that, you know, because that gives us an out. We don't have to be perfect. You know, I am what I am by the grace of God. But see, what we do, Brother Bob, we use that excuse not to be anything more than what we are. But if we like, by the grace of God, I am what, we, what I am, we also have, must, you know, look at it this way, by the grace of God, I'm, I'm where I'm at because of this is where He wants me. It didn't catch God by surprise, you being planted where you're planted. He orchestrated a plan for your life to get you right where He's got you. Hmm? Stop pining to be Brother Tommy and just bloom where you're planted. You've got the wrong perspective. Put your perspective in the fact that God has me here for a reason, and while I'm here, by His grace, I'm going to do everything I can to glorify Him. I'm going to do everything I can to let sinners know Jesus loves them, and if Jesus can save me and help me through this mess, He can help them through their mess. Huh? Listen. We lose sight so much because we are self-centered we think everything is about us it's not about us it's about him and God could have done anything that he wanted to do to bring sinners under repentance but he chooses to use us and we lose so much ground to the forces of hell because we are so much looking internally instead of looking at the real need I'm reminded of a story I heard. This young boy wanted to go fishing with his friend. I mean, that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to go fishing. Now, this obviously is a long time ago because of what video games. You know what I'm saying? Huh? These boys have never come in and said, Sharon, Mommy, let's go fishing. You would love for that. You say, boys, get out of my hair, right? Huh? This boy wanted to go fishing with his friend. He's begging his mom, begging his mom. She says, no, I've got to go to the market and get something for dinner tonight. And he kept pleading, kept pleading, kept pleading. He said, look, I'll catch a mess of fish. We'll have fish for dinner tonight. So finally, she concedes. She lets him go fishing. Him and his friend, they head off to their favorite watering hole. They go fishing again. I'm telling an old story, watering hole. You know what I'm saying? Uh, need definition. See Brother Bob, all right? Uh, but... They go to their favorite watering hole, Brother Jack, and they get down there and they discover a nest of snakes. So they start killing snakes. I'm all for killing them. Kill them all. Burn them all up. Torch them. Get them. Genesis 3.15, put enmity between that serpent and the woman's seed. Anybody like snakes, you're weird, okay? You need to get right with God, all right? These boys are down there, they're killing snakes. They get to kill them, they get to enjoy killing them. They end up killing them all day long. Comes time to go home, the boys go home. Mama's at the, at the porch saying, where's the fish? So I don't have fish, Mama, we killed snakes all day. That's our problem. We're spending too much time killing snakes instead of fishing for men. 
You're spending too much time with your problems and putting out fires and worrying about this and worrying about things a uh, hundred years from now will not matter. Uh, but what you can take to glory with you is the souls of men. Uh, what does matter is people uh, getting born again and saved. Uh, uh, friend, your perspective will change when you get your eyes off the snakes. Don't lose sight of what this is really about. It's about souls. Can I say, winning feels like losing when you got the wrong perspective. Can I say, secondly, winning feels like losing because of a power struggle. Paul went on to write to the church at Corinth that we've been bought with a price. Our life is no longer our own. But somewhere along the line, we've got it in our mindset. We can live however we want to and just do what we want to do, when we want to do it, and God's pleased with it because we come to church. There's a power struggle. We're grieving the Holy Spirit of God because we are not letting Him have His way and let His office work be completed in our lives. This is what the Bible says in Ephesians 6.10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. The reason you feel like losing is you're trying to do the work. And you can't. In John 15, he says, without him, we can do nothing. Hmm? Galatians 2.20, my life verse, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm glad he saved me, but that was just the beginning. Now I've got to learn to yield myself and become disciplined enough to die daily to the flesh and let the Lord Jesus Christ live through me. Amen. Only by His vicarious life being lived through me can I be what I am intended to be, victorious. Listen, well, you know, I, the Lord's enlarged my coast. I, I hate to sound like I'm boasting, I mean, but the Lord bless. I, I, I met a lot of preachers. I preach a lot of places. I go a lot of places. I'm sick and tired of hearing everything about the faith all being rounded to numbers. Listen, Jesus wants to save everybody. He died for everybody. It's His will that none should perish. But a lot of times we lose sight of individuals. You are so important to God, and He loves you. And we lose sight of that so much. He cares for you. He said, cast all your care, and for He cares for you. But it seems like success and victory is always tied to, to numbers. Well, what do you do with Jeremiah? He preached 40 years, and we have no evidence of one convert. But in God's eyes, he's ultimately successful because he did what God told him to do. When we learn, to quit struggling with God and allow Him to do what He wants to do in our lives, then we are successful. Then we have victory. Then we'll have joy. We'll have the peace of God. We'll have love, gentleness, goodness. The fruit of the Spirit is incorporated in our life when we let the Spirit of God work through our lives. And then, by the way, that victory shows out on you and you will impact other lives because they'll see that hope you have that they don't have. They'll hear it in your tone. They'll see it in your countenance. They'll want what you've got. I remember a time when folks wanted to get saved because they'd see Christians and say, I want that life. You don't see that much anymore. You see, there's a power struggle. And when you wrestle with God, you lose. You feel like a loser because you are losing. You're losing the fight of faith. Because without faith, it's impossible to please Him. Let me move on. Why does winning feel like losing? Well, because of perception. Perception. Hebrews says this, the writer of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse number 1, Wherefore, seeing we were also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. Uh-oh. We don't like laying aside those weights. We like embracing them. And the sin which does so easily beset us, we don't like that either, because every time I preach on it, you get mad. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, 
looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. I think he was victorious, was he not? Hmm? Despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God, for consider him that endured such a contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Um, our perception gets messed up with our pers perspective so many times. What are you talking about, preacher? We appear to be losers based on what we're facing, what we're looking at. You, you've had, I've used the illustrations. When all you can see is your problems, nothing else matters. That's why he says looking unto Jesus, because when you look up to Him, guess what you don't see anymore? you got the wrong perception. You're looking in the wrong areas. You're looking at the problems. You're looking at the pitfalls. You're looking at the obstacles. You're looking at everything that's coming against you instead of looking at the one who can help you. It's not only based on what we're facing. It's based on what we're focusing on, what we're listening to. Hmm? Uh, when you're listening to Joyce Myers, God help you. Might as well listen to Kamala Harris. Uh Seriously, is that woman, doesn't she look like a dude? Something wrong there. Something really wrong there. Anyway, I digress. Say, Brother Doug, that ain't right. And it probably ain't, but she does look like one. I was looking at her today, I thought, wow. And they ought to pay her to keep her mouth shut. I wish somebody would. Lord have mercy. Uh, anyway, when you're listening to the wrong sources... It will grieve your spirit and you'll feel like a loser. You're listening to the wrong type of music. When you're listening to the wrong type of preaching. When you're listening to worldly philosophy. Hmm? When you're listening to, to what you want people to like about you on your phone. Instead of listening to what the Word of God says about you. Hmm? Where you're focused. It'll bring you down. Hmm? Can I say your perception of what you're feeling? Listen, we're not saved by our feelings. Hmm? We're saved by faith in the facts of the Word of God. When you exercise your faith in what God says and you believe on what the Lord says, that's what brings you to salvation, not how you feel. Now listen, there are feelings associated with salvation. Some days I get to think about what Jesus did for me and I get to feel pretty good. But on days like today where it's dreary and it's raining and, 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 and I get a headache and I don't feel good, it, it does not change my standing with God. I'm still saved. But unfortunately, so many Christians live on these roller coasters of emotion that I don't know if they're coming or going. Hmm? My standing is in Christ Jesus. And He's seated at the right hand of the Father. And nothing in this world changes that. And I can reside to the fact and be focused on the fact that he's in control. Now, y'all know I kind of like football a little bit. My boys played football. I like football. And if you ever notice anything about football, when they're recording the games to show the game film to the players for the next game, they're always way up high. The highest part of the stadium they can get at, they're filming it. And if you ever watch football, the quarterback... Every time he throws an interception, you know why he throws it? A lot of times he's in the heat of the battle. Somebody's about ready to sack him. Somebody's about ready to come down on him. And he looks and he throws, but he doesn't see the whole part of the field. He doesn't see that the defensive back's already made a break on the ball. He just sees the receiver and thinks he can get it in there. And he doesn't see the whole part of the field. You know what our problem is? Our perception's wrong. We don't see the whole picture. We don't see the whole part of the field. We just see this little area of our life. We see this little problem. We see this little thing. And we don't see what God's are doing. We don't see. We went and heard Brother Cody in Louisville last week. He, he had a great illustration. I'm going to steal it and not give him any credit, okay? He was talking about these people, and I don't even have it in my message. I'm, this, I'm, this, I'm running this rabbit right here, okay? You don't mind, do you? Yeah, you're a good rabbit hunter. All right. Hey, he, he's talking about these folks on this river boat. They're heading down a river. And a great dense fog comes in. And they can hear other boats going by them. And, and they can hear folks over on the shore. And they just know they're going to crash. What is this captain doing? Why isn't he stopping this boat? Why isn't he slowing her down? 
he, he actually seems like he's picking up steam and he's heading down the river and they get called for the first mate and said you got to cut, get a hold of the captain tell him he's got to uh, stop this boat we're going to crash we're all going to die yeah, we can hear other boats how can he see what's going on we can't see our hand in front of our face uh, and the first mate says hey 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 captain's got it all under control say so how can he have it under control the fog is terrible he said because the captain isn't down here on the level where we are He's way up there, way above the fog. He sees every bend in the river. He sees every boat. He sees it all. He's in control. I've got good news. Our captain is way higher than us. Hey, he's in the sides of the north. He sees the whole field. He knows what we're facing. Just trust the hand of the captain. It'll be all right. Uh, somebody text Cody and tell him I did better on that illustration than he did. All right? No. It's a true illustration. The captain's in control. Listen. Your perception has a whole lot to do with your sense of reality. Faith is trusting what you can't see. Years ago, I used to use the illustration. I hadn't cranked it out in a long time. I'll crank it out. we got folks who have been saved since then. We look at this chair. Now, I had these chairs made. 16 years ago. I know how this chair is made. This chair has an oak frame. And the corners of this chair, the oak frames are dual dialed in. They're screwed and glued. It's the strongest construction made on a chair. This chair has dual density foam made to last 16 years. These last real good because nobody sits in them. I always sit in that one every now and then. I switch it out because I notice I put on a little weight. You know what I'm saying? I can look at these chairs. They're well made. They're sturdy. They're not going to give. And I can make this statement. I can look at that chair, see how it's made, know everything about that chair, so now I have faith if I sit in it, it's going to hold me up. That's not faith, that's logic. Faith's when you look and there are no legs. You say, I'm just going to trust God that He's going to hold me up. That's, my dear friends, what we lack so many times when the problems come. That's why we feel like losers, because we can't figure out how God's going to do it. It's not our job to figure it out. Our job's just to trust Him. And He, my dear friends, never fails. We see that perception has a lot to do with feeling like losing when you should be winning. I told you I was made well. Things heavy. Why does winning feel so much like losing, preacher? A lot of times it's because of our passions. It's what we're preoccupied with. Well, I'm glad God doesn't show us what's on all of our minds. Aren't you glad we're not omniscient? Because we'd be amazed with what people come in those doors with, what they have on their mind when they come in. We ought to come in with worship. We ought to come in, sirs, we would see Jesus. Why we put that banner up there? So many times we come in with so much on our minds. Hmm? Now listen, that falls on ladies more than men. Men have one-track minds. If man's got his mind on his belly and what he wants to eat, that's all he's going to be thinking about. But women, are they, they, they're multi-track minded. They can think about 50 different things at once. A woman can be talking on the telephone, ironing clothes, feeding a baby, cooking dinner, running a vacuum sweeper all at the same time. Men can't do that. We're not that talented. huh? But I guarantee you, we come in those doors many times, our mind's not on God. We're preoccupied. I watch, you all don't think I pay attention, I watch. Some people come in and sit down. Instead, I don't even carry it in the sanctuary. Instead of taking their phone out and turning it off, I see them in the sanctuary sitting there. You think God's glorified in that? Wouldn't it be better if you come in, you sat down, you open your scriptures, and you started reading them, waiting for service to start? Amen. Hmm. Huh? I knew that would be real popular right there. Uh, I want, I, I'm going to go on record right now. We get to heaven, Jesus is going to back me up. One of the greatest detriments to the church in this age has been them little things we carry around that are made to make phone calls that we very seldom use them for that. Hmm? Uh, we're so preoccupied. Those things that we're passionate about tend to make us feel like losers because they're not eternal. Hmm? We look for temporary pleasures to bring satisfying happiness. It doesn't happen. 
Hmm? True victors set their affections on eternal joys and find a satisfaction that this world cannot imitate. You know why there's some people always happy in the Lord? Because they got their mind on Him. You know why there's some people and they never seem happy? Proof's in the pudding. Hmm? Hmm? Now, this is going back 40 years. Lord have mercy, 40 years. Shut up, you'll get there someday. Huh? My first secular educational degree after high school was in computer programming. And one of the first things we learned, by the way, everything I learned is obsolete. It's been obsolete for generations. One of the first things that we learned was something called GIGO, G-I-G-O, garbage in, garbage out. When you program a computer, if you put garbage in it, that's what you're going to get out. So every one of you get mad at them computers that don't do what you want it to do. It's because you didn't tell it what to do right. I know they call them smart and they got a brain. They really don't. They just do what you tell them. They take the input you give it, and then they bring out, and if you can't get it to work, quit hitting the machine. It isn't it. It's you. Well, the same thing happens in your life. If all you do is put garbage in, all that's ever going to come out is garbage. But if you learn to take the Word of God and the things of God, and you put that in, you won't be a loser. You'll find joy unspeakable and full of glory. And then let me say this. Why does winning feel like losing? Because of production. Ruth chapter 1, verse number 1. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land and a certain man of Bethlehem Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab he and his wife and his two sons far too many have jumped the ship right before the blessing comes and it impacts their family and standing with God in all spiritual things in the name of happiness and fruit and all this other stuff results you know how many people I've seen over the years leave a good Bible preaching fundamental church because they don't think they see enough going on, but they hear of a place with some wildfire down the road. They go down there, and before long, Brother James, their family's out of church. They're like Naomi. They went out full. They come back empty. Hmm? They heard famine hit the land. They heard there was some bread down there in Moab. They went down there. They left the house of bread, seeking bread, only to lose her husband and two sons. Hmm? So many times people bury their children in Moab because they're not satisfied in happiness and fruit and all those. They got their sights set on something other than being steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Let me say this. It's not God's will for somebody to leave a good fundamental church just to go down the road. Hmm. It's, it's not God's will. Now, what propels that a lot of times, people get their fur uh, you know, rubbed the wrong way. People don't like the uh, who gets to sing, or people don't like who didn't shake their hand. They come up with all kinds of excuses, but the bottom line is they need to get their heart right with God. Hmm. I know that was real popular. Hallelujah. Let me say this lastly, I'll be done. Why does winning feel like losing? Because of undisciplined practice. Most of you know Sid played college ball. Sid had a, a stellar high school career. She had a stellar college career. You know what Sid didn't have? Many friends that were teammates. Sid showed up to put into work to become the best player she could be. And if you wasn't going to work, get out of her way because she's going to run over you. She wasn't real popular with a lot of her teammates. Because a lot of folks are just happy being on the team. There are others who are driven to succeed. I know we live in a day and age where if you sign your little kid up, he gets a trophy at the end of the year. That was not the case back when I played. You got the trophy when you won the championship. Second place meant you was the first loser. Huh? Miss Nett used to get so mad at me. I wouldn't let the kids win at checkers. They had to beat me. Uh, we, didn't, we, didn't, we didn't develop that loser mentality at the foster household. Matter of fact, I hadn't told her, but if John ever proposes to her, 
He's going to have to change his name to Foster. <laughs> you down with that? Yeah. That's what I thought. <laughs> He's a big old boy, but I think he'll comply. <laughs> Look what he gets. Huh? But she didn't make a lot of friends of her teammates because she wanted to be the best. And can I say, in the Christian faith, to become a winner, you've got to want to be a winner. You can be satisfied just coming to church and being on the team, but you're going to have that loser mentality all the days of your spiritual life. Then you're going to go to the judgment seat of Christ, and you're not going to have a leg to stand on, and you're going to watch what works you had get burned up because you were satisfied in having loser mentality instead of rising above it and becoming a victorious Christian. Can I say the book of Joshua in the Old Testament and the book of Ephesians in the New Testament are mirrors of each other. They teach us how to live and have victory in our Christian life. Now, let me say this. Problems make us feel like we're losers because we've been brainwashed to believe that's, the, that's why. Hmm? You know, if, if, you, if you didn't have problems because you're a great Christian, hogwash. I have found the greatest Christians usually have the biggest problems. Uh, but listen, problems are tools for God to get glory out of our lives. That's all they are. They're just a resource that God can use to show the world that we have something they don't have. If you go study Job, the devil didn't bring up Job, God did. And Job suffered more than anybody I've read after in the Bible. But in the end, God was glorified in it. But listen... Some problems God don't put in our lives. Some problems are self-inflicted. And the reason you feel like a loser is you've allowed it to come into your life. Let me give you a few and I'll be done. If the phone flipping and the other things haven't upset you, this will, okay? Not trying to upset you, trying to help you. Don't you feel like a loser? You have victory in Christ. But here's why you feel like a loser sometimes. Huh? If you have financial problems, it might be because you're not tithing and giving an offering. Now listen, from time to time, everybody can run short. From time to time, everybody can get an unexpected water uh, tank blows up, the roof needs to be replaced, something you didn't uh, put uh, money back for, and you got to go borrow some money. Ever, from time to time, everybody be a little tight. Are you listening? But if you perpetually have financial problems and you can't pay your bills and you can't uh, uh, get ahead, you know why? You're probably not tithing and giving God an offering. Probably not giving money to missions. Huh? I've read Malachi chapter 3. Can I say, uh, uh, the Lord's taking pretty good care of me. Huh? I found if you put him first, you bring the first fruits to his house, uh, 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 you do your part, uh, he'll make that 90, that 85, that 80 percent, whatever uh, 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 you've got left go a whole lot farther than you make your 100 percent go. I promise you that, huh? Mm, you might be losing in your financial life because you're not putting God first. It might be self-inflicted problem. Hmm? If you've got faith problems, your faith problem might be because you don't study. Word of God. Don't read the Word of God. Don't memorize the Word of God. So then faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Huh? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. You feel like a loser because God's not pleased with you because you're not exercising faith. I hate to bring it up, but I'm going to bring it up. For 15 months, I told you, face diapers was a lie. If you didn't hear this yesterday, you're going to hear it tonight. Yesterday, the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that Andy Bashir's mask mandates and all the other CDC guidelines that he has used for 15 months in the state of Kentucky to overrule the, uh, the law of rule of this commonwealth have been unconstitutional. They brought in an expert who has testified in 400 cases, uh, an expert on it that said the droplets co from coronavirus, uh, there's no way one of these face diapers uh, could have stopped it. Uh, and social distancing is a farce. Uh, 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 it's all been designed to break our economy. It's all been designed to get people to depend on the government. Uh, it's all been designed by these uh, uh, tyrants trying to rule over our land. Uh, hey, this is nothing but a cloth. Uh, hey, and you have trusted in what they said. 
instead of living for God. Hmm? Where's Miss Kathy? Let me go see Miss Kathy. New Miss Kathy. Brother Mike Jackson did some work in her house. Invited her to church. You know the first question she asked? Do y'all wear a mask? He said, well, you can, but we don't. Preach or not. Say what happened? She started coming. Spent her life as a Catholic lady. Probably a very good Catholic lady because she's a good lady. But here a few months ago, she got born again. Huh? Uh, isn't it wonderful that even a good Catholic lady knows there's no redemptive value in that face diaper? Isn't that a blessing? Huh? You want to wear one? Wear one. But don't force me to. Because I'm not doing it. Haven't done it. You say, people look at you like a freak. Who cares? I look at them like they're a freak. So it's even. But a lot of people got faith problems. You stay in the midst of your cesspool of obstacles in, in, in Loserville because you don't really believe God is greater than your problems. I just believe He is. Hmm. I, I hate to run to this. I always run to it, but I'm going to run to it. That's Miss Annette. Valentine's Day, 2019. When she called to tell me I had cancer. She'll tell you. I told her, I said, it didn't catch God by surprise. It'd be okay. Can I say? I feel guilty saying I had cancer. You know, eight days it was gone. Two surgeries, boom, gone. Right. Hardest thing about my cancer wasn't chemo, radiation, I didn't face it. Hardest thing was going and telling her. You know, we didn't tell anybody until we told the kids, and she was playing a weight game. We had to drive way down in the middle of nowhere, and watch her play ball, and then afterwards tell her, and then we had to leave and watch her get on a bus upset that she knew her daddy had cancer. What I'm telling you is, I may have had cancer, but cancer didn't have me. Because I know in whom I believed in and persuaded he's able to keep that, which I've committed unto him against that day. What I'm trying to say is, he's bigger than anything that comes my way. I've learned that. Hmm, you got a faith problem, you just need to get in a book. Man, I see where he's, he's done all kinds of great things in this wonderful word that he's given us. You might have a fire problem. You need to pray. Prayer is where the fire comes from. That's where the power comes from. I'm not talking about them little lay me down to say, I'm talking about grabbing the horns of the altar and staying there till you get some help from God. Uh, you might be here tonight, you might have a focus problem. Can't stay focused on, on, on the Word of God, the things of God. You might need to fast. Oh, I know that's, that's a dirty word in the Baptist church. Uh, especially after that big meal we had around here Sunday. But sometimes you just need to, you need to fast and pray and, and get your focus back in tune. Huh? You, might need a, you might have a freshness problem. Listen, I'd love to tell you every day you're on fire for God, but sometimes even your Christian life gets stale. Even a preacher, sometimes it gets stale. Why do you think sometimes I just go to meetings somewhere just to hear some preaching? I need to get out of my staleness. That's why. Huh? Last year, I went down there to Jacksonville, told Miss Ned, I said, this, this preacher's been kind enough to invite me. I don't know him. He don't know me. I don't know anybody. Come find out I knew two guys in the meeting. But I, I, I said, I, nobody knows me. I'm just going to go down there and sit and listen and try to hear God say something to my soul. It was a great meeting. That's where I met Brother Don Chitty. What a blessing that was, huh? So what I'm trying to say is sometimes you have a freshness problem. Get stale. You know the best way to get out of your staleness? Witness. Yeah. Tell somebody about Jesus. It's real difficult to talk about Him and stay, stay stale. Huh? Huh? Just tell somebody about how good Jesus has been to you. That'll help you with your, with your freshness problem. Maybe you've got a forgiveness problem. Boy, that, that, that's thick in our churches. Boy, somebody did you wrong, you don't want to forgive them. Then you get over there reading in Ephesians, you find out you better forgive them. So what, what do you do when you've got a forgiveness problem? Well, first of all, repent. Ask God to forgive you for not having a forgiven spirit. And then go show that person you're upset at kindness. That'll help you with your forgiveness problem. huh? I'm talking about these undisciplined practices make us feel like losers. The last thing, you might have a fondness problem. You know how... To get your fondness back and your love for the things of God back, just go back and visit Mount Calvary one more time. Go back and read what Jesus did for you on the cross. And that'll cause you to fall in love with Him again, friend. That'll cause you to fall in love with His church again. That'll cause you to fall in love with the things of God again. A 
fondness problem. I've said all that. I preached way too long tonight. I've enjoyed myself, though. Uh, but, but can I say this? I've said this all, all week. I've been dealing with folks just feeling like losers when you can have victory. You're not a loser. Your faith in Jesus Christ has made you an overcomer. You're not a loser. You're not a second-class citizen. You are of a royal priesthood. You are of a chosen generation. You are above the rudiments of this world. You are citizens of glory. You're not a loser. But a lot of times we get in those ruts feeling that way because we get everything out of perspective and out of perception. Tonight, maybe you need to come. Ask the Lord to help you. Maybe you need to come tell the Lord you're sorry you haven't been looking unto Him. Maybe you've been doubting Him. You need to come and ask Him to increase your faith. Maybe you just need some help. Say, Lord, I need some help in all this. I know one thing. He's a present help in time of trouble. Maybe tonight He's dealt with you about something else. Maybe you're here tonight you're not saved. The Lord's been speaking to your heart. You know you need to get saved. Why don't you come tonight? Let's take a Bible, show you how to be saved. You can get saved tonight. On a Wednesday night, be the greatest night of your life. Maybe you're here tonight, and it's something else. Maybe you just want to tell Him thank you. Maybe you just want to tell Him you love Him. Maybe tonight you just want to ask Him to help you be a better witness and bring more glory to His name. I don't know what your need is, but I know they can all be met. In Jesus. Let's all stand. Brother Clint, come get a song of invitation. Folks are praying. You just mind the Lord tonight. By all means, if you're here tonight and need to be saved, why don't you come and let us take the scriptures and show you how you can get born again. Folks are getting help. Folks are coming. They're picking out a song. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for first loving us. Lord, I feel for your people, letting their flesh, or the world, the devil, even their own selves beat themselves up thinking they're losers help them to have victory in Jesus when they leave here tonight maybe somebody needs to come tonight and get born again I pray the sweet Holy Spirit of God through cords of love would draw them to an altar of repentance maybe there's somebody here tonight just needs to come and thank you Lord maybe somebody needs to go to somebody and get something made right I don't know but I know we all need to live in victory and shine as lights in a dark place Lord, be that city set on a hill. It's not time to hide the candlestick, but to shine so folks can see Jesus. Now speak to hearts. Have your way in this invitation. We'll thank you for what you do, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Turn to what page, Brother Ray? Or Brother Clint? 174. Folks. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, Thanks for listening.